you have the title. You have the title there. So Hitai, you can start, please. Thank you. Uh, so I would like first to thank the organizers for this invitation. It's really a great honor for me to give a lecture in this uh, uh, Lajinsky Centennial uh, Conference. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Dimitri Golivati from the University of Ekron. Uh, it's a work that uh, appeared uh, last year in Arma. Okay, so uh, let's see the motivation. So uh, it's Ericsson uh, model, a, a simplified version of Ericsson model in liquid crystal theory. The energy is given by this expression. So we have two functions describing the, the liquid crystal, S and N. S is a scalar function. N is a vector value, the function taking values in the two-dimensional sphere. And we are working in the model, the physical model, we are working in R3, omega is an R3. Uh, and in the general form of the, of the energy, there is another term, a potential term that we omit here. Now, uh, so, uh, quite a few authors worked on this model uh, dealing with different aspects, uh, existence of minimizers, regularity, numerics, uh, notably by uh, Lean, Art and Lean. Uh, numerics was done by Noce Nocetto and uh, his collaborators. And there is a, a, an equivalent way to present uh, the energy by working with a single unknown u, but uh, taking values in R3. So u is defined to be s times n, which means that in the original model, s is the uh, norm of u and n is its orientation, u divided by the, the norm. Uh, and then we have this uh, uh, formula for the gradient u square in terms of uh, s and n. And using this, we can rewrite the energy in terms of u alone. So we have k minus one times the gradient of the norm of u square plus the gradient of u square. And if we switch to, uh, so k is a part, or in the original problem, k is a parameter uh, of the material, uh, we switch to another uh, parameter epsilon, which is one over square root of k. And uh, then we have this uh, expression in bold. Th this is actually the energy we are going to work with in the sequel. And uh, although the original problem is in R3, both in the domain and the target, we are going to uh, study a non-physical two-dimensional case where it's two-dimensional in the domain and also in the target. So you see omega is in R2, but also U takes values in R2. Uh, in our uh, paper, we describe uh, a way to, to, to give it a physical meaning as a sin field model. But uh, okay, but we, we lose a little bit the uh, connection with the physical world here. But uh, from the mathematical point of view, I think it is interesting. And so what is the setting of our problem? So omega is a two-dimensional bounded smooth and uh, simply connected domain. We, are, we have a, a boundary condition taking value in S1. This is important. And, for, and, and so for each epsilon, we denote by U epsilon a minimizer for uh, this energy, the energy I wrote before, E epsilon of U, uh, for uh, maps taking value in R2, but uh, with the boundary conditions, they should satisfy uh, given by G. Yeah, so we denote this uh, space by H1 sub G omega values in R2. And the problem is to study the limit of the minimizers uh, when epsilon goes to zero, which was would be K going to infinity in the original setting. Now, a, a remark I should uh, make is that when the degree of G is not zero, there are no maps in H1 of omega taking value in S1. I insist taking value in S1 that satisfy the boundary condition G. This is clear for continuous functions because of a Brouwer degree. 
since we assume that the degree of G is non-zero. But it's not so clear for H1 maps, but there is a degree theory that was developed also for uh, maps in H1 in the, that in dimension show, uh, two shows that uh, you, you don't have, uh, uh, this space is, uh, is empty. So it, this means that if you want to consider nevertheless the say the problem of uh, the minimum of the energy of S1 valued maps satisfying the, the, the degree, uh, the, the boundary condition G, you cannot because the, min the minimum is infinity, but, but you can relax the problem. And, and one can say that this is one way to relax the problem because you see what, would, what we expect when epsilon goes to zero. So we penalize the gradients of the modulus of U. So we somehow we force it to be modulus of U to be constant. Now, we don't see one, why constant one? But since the boundary condition G as modulus one, the constant modulus we expect to find in the limit is one also. So we, we find in the limit as we expect to find in the limit S1 value the maps, map, but probably we, surely with singularities when the degree is non-zero because of what uh, uh, I just said. Now, uh, this is not, of course, the first problem of this type of that, you, that can be viewed as a relaxation of the, this problem of uh, maps, uh, uh, of S1 valued maps of uh, minimal energy. Uh, so a famous, more famous uh, model is the Gitzbo Lambda model, where uh, the question is the same, minimizing something, but the something is different. The Gitzbo Lambda energy, you also have a penalization here, but you penalize the term uh, of the integral of one minus the modulus of u square square. So in the limit, you, you see that uh, when epsilon goes to zero, you, you somehow you push u to take value s1 to take values in s1 to, to, to the mod, to face to force the modulus to be a one in, in the limit. Yeah? And, and the famous results of Betuel Brzez and Delau says that if the degree say is positive, so greater or equal to one, then uh, they gave a, a precise description of the limit of the minimizer u epsilon. So for up to subsequence, it converged to a singular S1 valued map, but with very, a very simple structure. It's called the canonical harmonic map with uh, singularities at the point A1 up to AD. And uh, away from this uh, singular set, you have convergence in C1 alpha to this U star. And what about the energy itself? It, it blows up. But it blows up uh, at a logarithmic rate. And uh, if you subscribed the core energy, which is 2 pi d uh, log epsilon in absolute value, you find a limit. And the limit it, uh, it is sum of two terms. The second term is not so interesting to us. is d times some universal constant. But the first one is very important because it really determines the location of the points. So WAG. So in general, WBG is the, is the renormalized energy associated with the boundary condition G and the points you consider, a D distant point B1 to BD and what it is. So what you do, you, once you choose the points B1 to BD, you, you take a large, a, a very small, sorry, a small a disk around them. Of, of radius delta and you take all this disk away. This gives you the perforated domain omega delta. You consider uh, E delta, the set of uh, S1 valued maps on uh, this uh, perforated domain that satisfy the boundary condition G at the outer uh, boundary, the boundary of omega. And on the circles, on each of the circles, you just prescribe the degree to be equal to one. It turns out to be that uh, when delta goes to zero, the, this, the minimal energy on this uh, set of, of the gradient V square behaves also as two pi D log delta in absolute value. And when you subscribe it and you take the limit delta goes along to zero, you get some, su some number. And this number is the renormalized energy. It, it's what you get when you take out the core energy out of the 
uh, energy of, uh, of S1 valued maps uh, in this perforated domain subject to the boundary conditions that I described. So, so uh, to sum up, the points A1 to AD that you find in the limit, these are actually the, the configuration that minimize the, the renormalized energy over all possible of configuration of D points. Some remarks uh, that will, might be relevant in the sequel. So if you look at the ginsburg lander energy, you have two terms, the, the gradient U square and the, this potential term. The potential term remains bounded. And actually the, the, the most of the energy uh, comes from the other terms, which behaves as two pi D log epsilon in absolute value plus uh, O of one. Uh, and uh, also I would like to, to mention that for, for other relaxations, one also finds the same limit, even if things that looks a little bit different in the beginning. So Art and Lean consider another way to relax the, the problem. So uh, if you work in, in with the LP energy of the gradient, with P smaller than two, instead of the two, uh, the internal uh, gradient u square, then the, the, this space uh, W1G2 uh, minus epsilon with values in S1, so you can stay with S1 value maps, is not empty, and, you can, and there is a minimum. And uh, you can study the limits of the minimizers for this as epsilon goes to zero. And, and, and you find the same thing. Uh, the, uh, so uh, you find the, and, uh, the limit will be u star as before, and the, and the location of the singularities, exactly the singularities, yes, will be again uh, uh, can be found by uh, minimizing the renormalized energy. So one might expect that for our problem, we will find maybe the same thing, but it turns out a spoiler, it's not exactly the same for in our case. So back to our energy as uh, that I recall here in the title. So we penalize the gradient of the modulus of U square. Yeah? And uh, to, to start and to get some intuition to the problem, let, let's work on a simplified problem. So consider omega, which is a disk of radius R around, around the origin and uh, a boundary condition, which is EID theta. One can consider possible minimizers, which are also this symmetric. So they have this, uh, this structure. Of course, we don't know a priori that the minimizers will have this form, but we can try it, try it out. And when we try it and write uh, uh, the energy for functions that satisfy these ansatz, we find this expression. So now the, the problem became much easier because we, we have only scalar unknown function, the, this f of r. And uh, it turns out that Minimizing over this class of functions of this form, uh, we can compute easily what is the minimal energy for each fixed epsilon. It's two pi d over epsilon, exactly. And the proof is one line. Uh, we write the energy above as, a, as the integral of sum of two squares. We apply the cauchy schwarz inequality, but it's the, the inequality is that a squared plus b squared is greater or equal than 2ab. And then we find the a, a, an integral that all of us uh, can co compute and it turns out to be two pi d over epsilon. And we can also look for the case of equality here in this point by the uh, inequalities that we use and we find the easily what is the case of, of equality. So the optimal f is I denoted by f bar is actually it's a power of a little r uh, just uh, so we take it to the power d epsilon sorry where d is where d is the degree, d epsilon, and you just uh, divide by capital R in order to satisfy the boundary condition, it should be equal one uh, on the boundary. Now, of course, this doesn't, for the moment, it doesn't solve the problem for this boundary condition because we, we look just on a subclass of uh, admissible functions, but we can st still use it and easily get an upper bound in the general case. So suppose we have a, 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 a general omega simply connected in dimension two and the boundary condition of degree D. Uh, we claim that 
Uh, the energy is bounded above by 2 pi d over epsilon plus a constant. Uh, okay, so the proof is very easy because we can assume with across regionality that zero, uh, the origin is in omega and then consider a, a disk of radius r uh, in the domain. In, and now we construct a, a test function. So in the disk, we use the previous disymmetric minimizer that we found before. So the energy coming from this uh, disk is two pi d over epsilon exactly. And now we, are, we just have to complete our map uh, in omega minus this uh, disk. So uh, we just take a, a, an S1 valued map, a smooth one that satisfies the boundary condition EID theta on the inner circle and on the exterior uh, boundary, the, the, the boundary of omega, we, we use G because we want to satisfy the boundary condition. And since the degree is D both on the boundary of omega and on the boundary of the circle, there is a, such a, a smooth map. And since it's S1 valued uh, for the energies, there is no contribution uh, with the term from the terms that it's penalized uh, with the term with epsilon because the modulus is equal to one all the time. So it's only the gradient of, of V, the, the integral of gradient V square uh, on this domain that, which is a constant that enters into the energy. And, um, and so we get uh, for this map that just contracted, we get this, this bound, two pi d over epsilon plus C. Uh, okay, so of course, this is a legitimate upper bound, but the question, is it optimal? And now it turns out that lower bound that usually in many problems is it's not obvious, it's quite easy to get in our case, in the general case. And I will show you this in a moment. And I claim that we have this lower bound that is valid in all cases, two pi d over epsilon. Uh, once we know it's true, it's also, optim uh, it's also optimal because we saw uh, uh, the case, uh, the disymmetric case, what happens there, we get the quality. So, uh, so let me show you the picture. It's, a, a, it's as you see, a, a quite short. So the first stage, we take an, any admissible function u and we write its energy in this form. So you see here is the penalized term and this is the, the other part of the energy uh, taking into uh, consideration the, the energy from the phase of u or, or u over modulus u. And now we apply the same cauchy schwarz inequality or a squared plus b squared greater or equal than 2ab and we get this. Last step essentially, apply the coherent formula. So in the coherent formula, we write the, 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 our domain as the union of, uh, of the level sets of, of modulus of u. So for each t, we look at the set where modulus of u equals to t. Uh, so this is essentially the, the integral, the, the coherent formula uh, tells you to, to write down, but not that uh, it also tells you that you should divide by the gradient of the function you use to, 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 to write the domain, uh, to, to, uh, to, to look at the, the level set. So, so we divide by this, this doesn't appear anymore in this uh, formula. And now modulus of u is t. Now in the inner integral t, we can take it out. It doesn't play any role. And you have the integral of gradient of the normalized u, the, the direction, the orientation of u. So it's essentially the gradient of the phase of u. And it's not difficult to see that when you look at the closed, the, it closed the curve or a union of closed curves of this form, you get two pi, two pi times the degree. So look, look at this example here. Uh, for different values of t, I wrote, the level set. So for small t, suppose in this case, we assume that uh, u has two zeros, a1 and a2. So for small t, like here, probably there are two curves. The level set uh, is composed of two uh, closed curves. When you increase t, eventually you will get only one, one curve, like for t prime here and t double prime here. So uh, whatever, when you write for, you look at this integral, uh, say for on the union of those two curves, you will get the two pi d where d is the total degree and the total degree is, is d. And then we, it's very similar to what we, we, we found in the disymmetric case. We get it again in integrals that we know to compute and get to get two pi d over epsilon. 
So this tells us that the upper bound we found below is also optimal. So in some sense, we, 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 we already know quite a lot on, on the problem. We know is that the, the, the energy of the minimus behaves like two pi d over epsilon plus a constant. And in addition, we know that in the disymmetric case, what we found before was actually the, the true minimizer. Uh, now, a priori, we, because of the lower bound, we know that we found a minimizer over the whole class. So we, we can say that we solved the problem in the disymmetric bound, for the disymmetric boundary data. Okay. Um, now, uh, it turns out that there is a, a larger family of uh, boundary conditions, special boundary conditions for which we know also the solution. And this is the case of Blaschke products. Uh, by the way, the fact that we, we, we face uh, some uh, uh, notions from complex uh, theory, complex function theory, it comes from the fact that our energy is actually conformally invariant. Uh, this also tells us that if we can always assume that we are working in the unit disk because of Riemann mapping. If we are given another two-dimensional uh, symmetric connect domain, we can use uh, this, uh, the Riemann mapping in order to transform our problem from the original domain to B1. So, and this is also useful. In any case, here we consider B1, consider uh, D points, not necessarily distant, and consider this Blaschke products of de factors. Now, when alpha is zero and all the points are the origin, we find z to the power d, which will mean that we meet again the disymmetric case that we considered before for the boundary data. And then it turns out that also in this case, we have a very simple form for the minimizer for any fixed epsilon. And it is given by this. It's very similar to what we did in the disymmetric case. We fix the orientation. We take F over modulo F as a, in the boundary condition, but we take the modulus to the power epsilon. Um, and then the energy in this case for this function, the energy is exactly two pi d over epsilon. And since we know what is the possible minimal energy, which is also two pi d over epsilon in the general case, it turns out that this is indeed the minimizer. Now, uh, this is not very difficult to, 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 to verify. What happens essentially is that in the lower bound computations that I used uh, in the previous slide, uh, we look at the case of the pointwise inequality for a squared plus b squared greater than 2ab, we looked at the case of inequality, and it turns out that uh, in this case, uh, thanks to the, actually to the fact that we, is, we have uh, two harmonic uh, conjugate functions, one's, one is the phase of f, and the second is the log of the modulus of f, and it turns out that this is enough in order to get uh, equality. You see, this is actually the equality in the pointwise inequality we use there. And, and this is the, the result. With some more, not too much extra work, we can show that this is actually the unique minimizer. Uh, okay, so now uh, what, what we are left to do, we, we, we know how the energy behaves, but we want to, 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 to get the convergence result to, to, to show that u epsilon converge as epsilon go to zero up to subsequence at least, and to identify the limit. And uh, a basic step or first step for it is, is a construction of bed disk. Now uh, in the Gisbo-Landau theory, this is indeed the uh, in the work of Peter Bezisela and others that followed it, 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 it it's a crucial step. We, we, we do it in our case again, although the technical uh, details are a little bit different. So in any case, we want to, to show that the bed set where uh, the modulus of u is, of u epsilon is small. It's, it's small, it's uh, away from one. We want to show that it's relatively small. Uh, and this is, can be done by covering it by a, a finite number, uh, bounded, the number M is bounded by epsilon, finite number of bed disks of small, of, of, which are of small radius. Now, uh, uh, because of this conformal invariance that I 
uh, mentioned before, it's, it's convenient actually to use hyperbolic bell, uh, balls and not the, the Euclidean balls. So uh, uh, you see that the radius is extremely small because it's of the order exponential minus C over epsilon. Uh, and this can be done, and uh, th this is indeed possible thanks to the following property, which requires, of course, a, a proof. If it, at some point the modulus is far from one, so it's less than beta, then necessarily the energy in an hyperbolic uh, disk of radius uh, 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 inverse hyperbolic tangents uh, of R epsilon, uh, again, R epsilon is E minus C epsilon, so then the energy is in this, this is uh, bigger than a constant over epsilon. Uh, and now recall that we have an upper bound of the order C over epsilon. This means that we can only have a finite number of disks with this property. And this is the, the crucial uh, properties that enable us to cover the, the surface epsilon by a finite number of, uh, of, of disks. Now, the, this means that we already have some information about uh, the modulus of u epsilon. So uh, you have a finite number of, uh, of disks. Uh, notice that I uh, try to, to, to write, uh, to, to draw the, the, the disks. The disks should have the same radi uh, radius, but it's hyperbolic radius. So when they are close to the boundary, the Euclidean uh, radius is smaller. So in any case, uh, we, uh, what we try to do, or we need to do, is to control the phase of u epsilon outside the bed disk in order to, 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 to get convergence. And uh, this is not so obvious, but uh, we were able to do it uh, using a, a method that uh, um, Pietro Mironescu and myself used five years ago in another, another problem. So once we have control of the phase, we get indeed the convergence result. So let me state the first theorem that we have, the first main theorem, it's the convergence result. So first I just recall, because I didn't state it uh, officially just uh, orally, that the, the, the energy of, of u epsilon behaves like this, it's between two pi d over epsilon and two pi d over epsilon plus c. Now for the convergence. We have convergence outside a finite number of points again to an S1 valued uh, uh, harmonic map with singularities at the point A1 to AN. And notice of each singularity of degree DJ greater or equal to one, the sum of them should be equal to the total degree D, but we, I don't say that the degree is one as in the Gitzvolandau uh, case because it's, it's not necessarily two. We saw it in the disymmetric case. And so the, the, the limit is again, similar to what we, we saw in the gitz case, but the difference as I write down here is that the degrees might be great, strictly greater than one. They are not necessarily one. We might have a j equal to zero for all j as we saw in the disymmetric case, for example. So this is a, 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 an important difference with respect to gitz and other relaxation uh, model that I mentioned before. Now, the main question that remains is identification of U star. And this is stated in theorem two. So the setting is as before. Uh, we already know that there is a limit and the limit has singularity is at the point AJ and the degrees are given by DJ. So, okay. So the energy we know it's behaves like two pi D over epsilon plus O of one. Now we are able to to prescribe what is O of one. So what is the what is the what happens when we subtract two pi d over epsilon from the energy? What is the limit? Uh, uh, in words, it's the distance. It's a certain distance square of the boundary condition G to the set of all Blaschke products which have d factors. Uh, this uh, set of Blaschka products is written here. We already know that Blaschka products are important because in the particular case where, where G is a, a Blaschka product itself, we saw that actually it's not only in the, we have zero on the right hand side, but actually we have zero for any epsilon, not just as the limit, because the energy for any epsilon is exactly two pi d over epsilon. So we saw the roles uh, Blaschka product plays here. Now, what uh, I, I need to tell you 
So the singularities are given by the Blaschke product uh, with factors AJ, with AJ, which minimize uh, this distance over all possible Blaschke products. Now, what is this distance? Let me explain what it is. Okay, so first I have to uh, de uh, describe what is the, dis the dh one half distance between G and the particular Blaschke products. So take a Blaschke products with uh, factors using the points B, BJ, G, J goes from one and D, and the BJ, some of them may be equal between, not necessarily distant. What we do is the following. We take G and we take the Blaschke product. Uh, when you divide G by the Blaschke product on the boundary, you are left with uh, an S1 valued map of degree zero, yeah? Uh, so you can write it as EI phi, where phi is a scalar uh, function defined on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the boundary, on the, on the boundary of the circle. You take the harmonic extension of phi and you calculate this, uh, the, the, the Dirichlet energy of this harmonic extension. This is what I call, and now once you do it for a, one, one configuration of Bs, you go over all the possible uh, configuration of the distant points and you take the minimum. This minimum is the, this, the H1 half uh, distance square of, of G from the product, from the Blaschke product, and this is the right hand side here. Okay, so, so this is the, uh, the second main result. Uh, okay, now uh, some complete uh, explanation uh, about, we also have an explicit uh, expression for this uh, distance, which is related to the renormalized energy of BBH, which, which also has a, 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 an explicit expression. And, and the, two, the two expression look similar. So this is for dh one half square, and this is for the renormalized energy of BBH. In both cases, you have uh, some function, kind of green function, uh, phi zero tilde, that satisfy a boundary condition depending, uh, a normal boundary condition depending of, on G. And uh, what is also essential is the regular part of this function phi zero tilde. What happens when you subtract the, the singular part of it, and then you get a regular function R zero, which appears in both of them in the same way. So what is the main difference? The main difference is that in the BPH case, you have this term, and in our case, we have this term. So uh, while in the, in the uh, Gesbo-Landau case, with this term, you cannot have bi uh, equal to bj because we, this make it blow blow up. While here, nothing happens when bi equals to bj. So th this is a, another uh, a, 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 an alternative way to see why in our case, we, we may have uh, the same uh, singularities at the limit while in the Gensbolando case, we, we don't. And now just to conclude, maybe uh, what is important here in our case is, is to find the limit uh, to get really a, 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 an exact energy estimate uh, for our energy, we, uh, we have to, to, to understand better the term uh, involving the gradient of rho. Uh, the gradient, not of, uh, gradient of rho, that is the gradient of modulus of u. Uh, uh, and say divide by epsilon. So essentially it turns out that rho epsilon, rho epsilon is the modulus of u epsilon. When you look at rho epsilon minus one over epsilon, Actually, it converges, it has a limit away from the singularities. And the, the, sing, and the limit is another, is another function uh, similar to the phi zero tilde that we saw before, because we have the same right hand side, but instead of, of a boundary, if a normal boundary condition depending on G, I, I recall, you see what we had in the previous case here, we have an, a, a zero Dirichlet boundary condition. And actually this phi zero in the case of the unit this is just the log of the modulus of the Blaschke associated Blaschke product. So the, the, this is uh, really uh, relevant for the term with gradient modulus of U square. It doesn't depend on, on, on G actually, it depends only on the points. 
and, and, and in order to prove it, the first step is actually to show that rho epsilon minus epsilon over epsilon is bounded away from the singularities because we really have to start to understand of, of the rate of convergence of rho epsilon to one. It turns out that it, it behaves like O of epsilon. Rho epsilon minus one behaves as O of F, big O of epsilon away from the singularities. Uh, and, uh, and what we use in this uh, a te a technical important uh, tool we use is the op differential uh, for this problem, uh, which takes this form and it's holomorphic. Uh, uh, so again, holomorphic maps play a role in our analysis. Uh, so uh, I conclude here and thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, did you hear me at all? Uh... Sorry, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, I was without sound. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, apologize. And uh, of course, now we have time for questions or for comments. So please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Itai, uh, you had um, uh, in the very beginning, you said that uh, uh, we can. Uh, 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 assume that all points are distinct in the minimizing uh, problem, in the minimization problem. Uh, but uh, what happens if, for example, you have a point uh, with the degree two uh, instead of uh, two distinct points? Uh, sorry, uh, can you, uh, what you refer to, when did I say that we can assume the, the, the points are distinct? Uh, you, no. you, you considered uh, a, um, an auxiliary problem. Uh, with uh, uh, points B, uh, which are uh, uh, which are distinct uh, and have uh, uh, degree one. Uh, it begins with lambda case or in my case? No, uh, earlier, uh, uh, close to the beginning of uh, your. Uh, 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 no, okay. earlier. Uh, earlier. Earlier. You say that A uh, minimize the problem for B. Uh, I'm still, uh, it's before that? Maybe, maybe before. No, be because I didn't do much before. Tak. This is Ginsburg Landau. Uh, yeah, before, before. Oh. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, this is Ginsburg Landau. Uh, w uh, is ah, 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 yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, what happens if uh, two uh, points uh, come uh, closer and closer and coincide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. What happens? The, okay, so <laughs> first you, you refer to the renormalized energy, uh, which is not my case. Yes. Uh, I, I, all my all my talk, I, I try to explain that yeah. what we found in our case is something different than uh, the uh, energy. But if you if you know, I can see you actually I can show you actually at the end. Maybe this is the explanation. Okay. Uh, uh, because I give you I gave at the end actually the 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 explicit expression of the renormalized energy of BBH. So look mm -hmm. at the bottom. Yeah. So you see the renormalized energy is also of BBH say is well defined also in the case where the points, uh, okay, so, so you may have degrees greater than one. You see this expression is in the case where you consider maps which have degree, which singularities. So around B1, you, you might have a degree D, D, D1 equals to two say. So, so this is the expression in the general case. Mm -hmm. so, so, so it's okay, but what you, you see, that if the points are getting closer, say BI became close to uh -huh. BJ, it blows up. Yeah, you have a log of zero and it's a minus, so it's going to plus uh, infinity. Okay. 
And then uh, you see it's not interesting for a minimizer to-, to, to Ah, okay, so it is uh, worse in the energy sense. Sorry? It, it, it is worse in the energy sense. It's worse, yeah, exactly. And this is the reason why for minimizers in the Ginsburg yeah, language, okay, okay, you don't okay, find, okay. You don't okay. find the degrees greater than one, while in our case, you do, and actually you do. You, 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 as our example, when you have degrees greater, uh, arbitrary degrees you can find, because okay. using such a product, you can produce example with arbitrary set of degrees. Uh, at least, okay, when they have the same sign, yeah? You can have degrees three and five for two points. Okay, thank you. All right, so more questions or comments, please? Well. If not, uh, we thank you again, Jeffrey. Thank you. For your thank, you thank you, Thank you. Thank you.